My name is Jürgen. I'll talk about reinforcement learning when there is only one single lifelong trial. And I'll point out that if we want to build a general reinforcement learning machine, an artificial general intelligence, as it is sometimes called, then we will have to focus on this single trial setting. Most current reinforcement learning agents are trained under the assumption of repeatable trials, and they are reset at the beginning of each trial. Humans, however, are never reset, and they can discover patterns across trials. For example, they can discover that whenever the trial number is divisible by uh, 7, then go left to obtain a lot of reward, otherwise go right. General reinforcement learning, or AGI, must assume a single lifelong trial, which may or may not be divisible into subtrials. And a general reinforcement learning must also explicitly take into account that policy changes in early stages of life may affect properties of later policy changes and later trials near the end of the life. In particular, general reinforcement learning must take into account recursively that early meta-meta learning is setting the stage for later meta-learning, which is setting the stage for later learning, and so on. Recursively. Most popular reinforcement learning mechanisms, however, ignore such lifelong credit assignment chains. And exceptions are the success story reinforcement learning algorithm from 1994, roughly, and the AIC system of my former postdoc and senior researcher Markus Hutter in the early 2000s and the mathematically optimal self-referential Gödel machine. By the way, true learning to learn is not just transfer learning. Any stupid neural network can do transfer learning from one bunch of data sets to a new data set. And true learning to learn also isn't just optimization of hyperparameters. Radical learning to learn is much cooler than that. It's about making your policy run the learning algorithm itself. In other words, you need a set of unusual actions that your policy can execute. And collectively, the set of actions or instructions must form a universal programming language such that the policy can, in principle, execute any algorithm or any learning algorithm or any meta-learning algorithm and so on. And to do that, you have to include instructions or actions that can be triggered by the policy itself, which change the policy explicitly. And then, once you have a self-modifying, self-referential policy like that, and you try to optimize it during the single lifelong trial, you have to somehow come up with a framework that makes sure that the policy changes that the system has executed in early life are still part of this credit assignment chain which is going through the entire life so far such that you can figure out over time based on empirical evidence which are the good self-modifications that were useful for obtaining more reward or more reward per time, and which are those that were not good, such that you can recursively 
establish a chain of self-modifications, of self-changes of this policy that has the property that each of them was followed by better performance than all the previous ones. For example, that each of them led to more reward per time than all the previous ones in this single lifelong trial. So let me now explain my first meta reinforcement learning system based on a single trial. And it goes back to 1994. And this picture here actually goes back to 1987. That was my first paper ever on uh, meta learning, which was focused on evolutionary algorithms for meta learning. While in 1994, that was really about self modifying self referential policies. And you will see that all the basic ingredients were already there. A policy which had the possibility to run a learning algorithm for modifying itself, and in turn also a meta reinforcement learning algorithm for modifying the learning algorithm running on this policy, and so on recursively. Plus, it had this scheme based on empirical evaluation of the outcome of the interaction sequences of the reinforcement learning agent with the environment, uh, which was designed to um, make the whole system accelerate reward intake over time. Now look at this policy. Look at the pink thing. The pink column is a probability distribution. And the numbers, the entries in these fields, add up to 1. And the most likely action is the one that is called move agent, because that has a probability of 0.7. So now we can execute this action, move agent, and it turns out it has two parameters. And then the next two columns, they give the current probabilities of these possible parameters that are needed for the agent to move a certain distance and a certain angle. And then uh, we execute that action and there is a feedback from the environment and that may change um, an internal state. Then we also have actions for manipulating this internal state, such as add and multiply and stuff like that. So here the policy is already kind of unusual and it even has this instruction pointer thing because each of these columns is marked by um, or can be um, uh, marked by an instruction pointer and the instruction pointer can move and we need that to make the whole thing a universal computer. Most traditional policies in reinforcement learning are not universal computers, but this one is. And then there is a crazy thing. There's this action, inc prop, increase probability, and that's an action that changes the policy itself because the parameters of the policy are these probabilities. And now the policy itself can execute this instruction um, which changes the probabilities of executing certain instructions given that the instruction pointer points at that particular column and so on. And suddenly we have a policy that not only can interact with the environment, but also can run in principle on itself. Arbitrary learning algorithms, including arbitrary meta-learning algorithms and meta-meta-learning algorithms. And now we have to find a way to make sure that all these self-modifications really make sense. And to achieve that, we need yet another instruction, which is called invoke SSA or invoke success story algorithm. Whenever the system itself executes this instruction, then a new checkpoint is set in the single lifetime trial of this system. And you can say that the 
period in between two checkpoints, V1 and V2, for example, is a self-defined trial. And the system itself must learn over time to, to find good trial lengths that yield enough statistical significance in the results because what the thing tries to do is maximize reward per time in the long run. And it wants to um, perform credit assignments such that each of these checkpoints is followed by more reward per time than all the previous checkpoints. And now remember that between two checkpoints set by the system itself, the system itself can execute all kinds of self-modifications through its meta-learning algorithms and learning algorithms, which it is trying to invent over time. And now we have this mess of self-modifications and we need this force to make sure that there is a continual acceleration of reward. And it's very easy to achieve that because whenever the system invokes this success story algorithm, then the system looks back and says, let's look at the reward per time that we got since the most recent checkpoint, which was followed by self-modifications and reward events and so on. And, um, and now let's measure, did we get more reward per time since then, until the current moment in life, than in the interval before? And if not, then we undo the last checkpoint and the self-modifications executed afterwards. Now, we have a slightly bigger time interval. And again, we say, if the uh, reward per time since this now last valid checkpoint exceeds what we have before that, then we keep it and we keep going. Otherwise, we undo that checkpoint as well and the self-modifications associated with it. Which means that whenever you invoke the success story algorithm, you make sure that the entire history of self-modifications, so far still valid self-modifications, is a success story where each of them has been followed by more reward per time than all the previous ones. So that's the nature of the success story algorithm, which is very general and universal in the sense that it doesn't care for Markovian properties. It doesn't care for all these limitations that you have with traditional reinforcement learning policies. No, it's much more general than that. Now look at this old experiment from almost a quarter century ago, when compute was about a hundred thousand times more expensive than it is today, but it's still relevant today. What you see are two agents, uh, agent A and agent B, up there starting in the left upper corner. And um, in this environment, it takes a long time to get reward for the first time. So actually, they have to cooperate and one of the agents, the upper agent, has to move over to the right to uh, wait there until the other agent, which goes down all the way to the lower right corner to grab a key, has an opportunity to come back, to go up there and open the door where the other guy is waiting. And then uh, the other guy can walk into the door and grab another key and then leave that room and go over there to the left lower corner open the door to that room and finally hit the goal, which is in the lower left corner. And to give you an idea of the initial bias, uh, of the initial instructions, uh, it takes um, initially 300,000 steps to just randomly get reward for the very first time. But then, over time and only driven by a self-referential policy which over time learns to modify itself in better and better ways and where the system learns to uh, define by itself the lengths of the trials between these checkpoints, 
within a day of computation time back then, or I think a couple of days of computation time back then, the system was able to um, to uh, greatly decrease that time, and I think the um, uh, right hand side shows it, 5,000 uh, steps per trial were needed after uh, after this single life training, where the system itself learned to divide its single life into appropriate trials. And over time it realized, well, these trials that I have to consider here are pretty long, otherwise I, uh, I get confused um, by lucky self-modifications which seem to accelerate reward but then um, over time didn't really. So the statistical significance uh, of the appropriate trial length has to be figured out by the system itself and it can do that. And many current systems cannot. The success story algorithm to my knowledge, was the first method that took seriously this concept of lifelong credit assignment. And even at the current moment in life, you are willing to um, perform credit assignment reaching all the way back to the beginning of your life. Because you always take into account the possibility that early learning or meta-learning or meta-meta-learning was suboptimal and should be improved re retrospectively and that you can learn something from the errors that you did back then and which took maybe a long time to pan out. So really performing credit assignment through the entire lifetime. And it worked nicely in certain rather complex environments, but it wasn't provably optimal. Its notion of progress was defined by this concept of reward acceleration, which is a greedy thing, and there was no proof that this is the optimal way of performing reinforcement learning. So then I became very ambitious and I tried to invent an optimal AGI, an optimal general reinforcement learning machine, trying to maximize expected reward within its limited lifetime with limited resources and uh, limited environmental resources. And that was the Gödel machine, which has certain, certain mathematical optimality properties. It is named after Kurt Gödel, the founder of theoretical computer science, who in 1931 uh, showed the limits of math and computation and artificial intelligence. How did he do that? Well, he, uh, he created a universal coding language based on the integers and then within that uh, formal framework he uh, created formal statements that talk about themselves and they say things such as I am not provable by a computational theorem proving procedure. And either this is true, then there are things that are not provable, or all of mathematics is flawed and all of logical thinking is flawed. And um, there he had the limits of uh, computing and AI. Now the Gödel machine is uh, inspired by that because it's also self-referential and the the uh, point of the Gödel machine is that it is interacting with an environment, trying to maximize reward, and at the same time uh, it has a proof searcher on board and it is trying to come up with a proof that modifies the current software of the Gödel machine, including the proof searcher, in a way that leads to more reward or to, to more reward than what you would get if you didn't execute this change. And whenever the Gödel machine comes up with such a provably good self-change, then automatically it must have proven also that it's not worth waiting for an even better self-change of its own software arriving later, during a later stage of the search. And so, in fact, 
it may completely rewrite itself in a way that it has shown to be optimal. The main issue, the main limitation, is that before the first self-change of the Gödel machine, there is a search, a proof search, which can be expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it can be expensive. And there is a way of initializing the Gödel machine through an asymptotically optimal way of solving problems, which is due to Markus Hutter, my former postdoc and senior researcher, but now um, a professor in Australia and Canberra and also working with DeepMind. And, um, and he found an, a way of uh, solving formalizable problems that is as fast as the unknown fastest way of solving a particular problem except for an additive constant which, um, which pales in comparison to problem size as the problem size gets larger and larger but nevertheless uh, most of the problems that we want to solve in this current universe and on this little planet here are so small that the constant overhead still plays a role. And that's why, why uh, we have certain practical limitations of these methods. The most visible applications of reinforcement learning in recent years were in robotics and video games. In particular, OpenAI learned to control a dexterous robot hand and also learn to excel at the Dota 2 video game. And uh, DeepMind learned to excel at the StarCraft video game. And probably you know that video games tend to be much harder than chess or Go because these board games are Markovian, which means that a simple feedforward network can learn to come up with a very good policy. While in video games, you uh, typically have to memorize things that happened in the past. And that's why these approaches that I mentioned for robotics and Dota and uh, StarCraft all have something in common. They all have a, a deep LSTM core, which is trained by policy gradient methods. We first published that in the early 2000s, before 2010, but this has become a really popular approach, but one has to admit that it's also kind of straightforward and simple. And, um, and I hope that we will be able to combine in the future the best of both worlds. On the one hand, these modern <laughs> LSTM-based um, reinforcement learning, uh, policy gradient, uh, optimizing uh, machines, and on the other hand, the concepts from these lifelong single trial meta-learners that I have discussed today. Thank you for your attention.